last message of heavenly benefits, turn your Bibles to Psalm 103. And um, as I have done every, every week for this series, we're going to start by reading out of Psalm 103, verse 5. Everybody loves benefits. Everybody loves benefits, and especially when it benefits you. And so the thing is this, is there are benefits that, that God has already established for us as believers. The thing is, is so many of the time people don't understand, don't even know, don't know how to access, don't know how to apply it to their life, don't even know that they have something to apply to their life. So this, this, uh, this series, if you've missed some of them, I encourage you to go back online and, and uh, check out some of the previous messages uh, that we've gone through. But I want to start off, and, and let's read. Today, I want to do it differently, though. though I want everybody, I want us all to read it together, okay? So let's read it together. Let's put Psalm 103, starting at verse 1 on the screen. It says this, everybody together, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, and who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Okay, so we are on the last, the last benefit today is the one who satisfies your mouth with good things. So I'm just going to go right into it. I'm going to do it a little bit like I did last week, and I'm just going to pose some questions to us, and we're going to dig in, and we're going to answer them here today. First question is this. Jot it down. What is satisfaction? You need to take a look, take an opportunity to write these down, then go back and look at it later. What is satisfaction? Here's the definition out of Webster's Dictionary. It says this. It's a fulfillment of a need or want. The quality or state of being satisfied. It's contentment, uh, gratification. It's the compensation for a loss or injury. You know, it's like you're satisfying a debt. It's atonement, restitution. It's vindication. That, that's, that's what you would see if you went in and pulled up that word, you know, uh, in a dictionary. But since the Old Testament is written in Hebrew... Let's go look at what the Hebrew word for satisfaction is, and let's see why God uses this particular word here. What you have to realize is that this word, satisfaction, in the Hebrew, it means to be made full. But not just full, it means full to the verge of overflowing. In other words, if, if you were to go and study the word a little bit more and go deeper into the word... The, the word has the meaning that it, it means to be full to where you're almost weary of a good thing. It's like, whoa, I can't take anymore. <laughs> I mean, the, and I know it sounds crazy, but the only thing I could think of to compare it to is like the way some of you act when you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, it, it's, it's like you, you've got a good thing, you've probably got a good deal, and all this food is there, and you can eat as much as you want. And you immediately move into this mentality like you have never eaten before in your life and that this is going to be your last meal forever and ever. So you choose to dig in and to take it all. And by the time you're walking out, you are what the, what the definition, you are full to the point of overflow. You loosen that top button on your pants and you're miserable and you got indigestion an hour later, you can't sleep that night because you were so full. See, that, that, that's what this is saying here. And the whole point of this is that, is that it's, getting across, it's getting across an idea that something good can be abused. So we have to be controlled with it. So it says that, that he satisfies your mouth you know, with good things. Notice that he didn't say he satisfies your heart or he satisfies your soul, you know, or he satisfies your desires. No, it says he satisfies your mouth. Now, this word mouth in the Hebrew is a very unique, interesting word. It, it shows up only 13 times in the Old Testament and just two of those 13 times is it actually translated mouth. The other 
11 times it's translated, and I'm going to say this, and you're, this is not going to make any sense to you when I say it, but hang in here, we'll explain it. It's translated ornaments. Ornaments. Yeah, you're thinking like your Christmas tree and stuff. It's ornaments. In other words, the word means in the Hebrew, horse mouth ornaments. A horse's mouth ornaments. The word that we would use today in our vernacular is the word bridle. See, a, a, a bridle, you know, goes, you, you know how it goes on the horse, some of you farming people, ranching people, uh, rural people, you know horses better than us city folks. Of course, I was, on, I was on the farmland in South Dakota for many years as a young boy, so I know what it is out there, but some of you may not. The thing is this, it's a, a bridle, and sometimes maybe they can be very ornamental. You know, some of the show horses got real fancy bridles, and, but the fact is, is that this is an, it's an ornament that goes on the horse and on the bridle, there is a thing called a bit. The bit goes into the horse's mouth. It's attached to the whole bridle system to the reins, and you can control where the horse goes. James, the third chapter, James uses this analogy of the bridle on a horse to, to describe the tongue. In other words, the tongue that is bridled can control or discipline the life, their life. So the person who has a controlled tongue is what it's talking about. So what this is actually saying to us is that God satisfies the person who controls his mouth with good things. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> now think about it. When you talk about the mouth, you're talking about two things. You're, you're talking about the words that are dispersed from the mouth. Okay, but you're also talking about the appetites you desire that you would embrace. But this is obviously isn't dealing with the appetite of food. It's, it's actually dealing with the flesh appetites, the, the, the carnal nature. In other words, if you cannot control your appetites, you will never, ever be satisfied. Never. So in other words, you will never truly benefit from this benefit of God's. So God is telling us that I'll satisfy your mouth with good things, but let me tell you the kind of mouth <laughs> that I'm going to satisfy. I'm going to satisfy the mouth that has learned to be under control. So he satisfies our controlled mouth with good things. So you need to remember this because you have read that passage of scripture before and you just read he satisfies their mouth with good things renews like the eagles oh come on Jesus just do it and you didn't realize that there was a part that you played in this whole thing the whole time he satisfies with good things so what is a good thing a good thing is going to be something to you and it's going to be something different to me you know the the, the bible says in James I like the way the new American standard says it it says that every good thing and every perfect gift given comes down from the father of lights in whose there's no shadow of turning Psalm 84 says that God will not withhold any good thing but it's to those who walk uprightly so see it's always got something that that we play a part in to to on on our end that that puts us in a position and puts us in right alignment you know the uh proverbs i think it's proverbs 18 it says this guys he who finds a wife finds a good thing not only that and obtains favor from the lord turn to your wife and say baby you are good come on if your wife isn't here, don't say it to any other woman, but just you, okay, just keep it right. All right, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. I, I found a good thing almost 43 years ago, almost 43 years ago. Yes, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll go right there, stop that. So anyway, yeah, so he who finds a good thing, he satisfies your mouth with good things. The second question is this, is who satisfies? You're going to say, well, wait a second. That's the easiest answer. Okay, but let me, let me just go down a trail here. In, in looking at all of these benefits, let me ask you, who forgives? God. Who heals? God. Okay. 
And God is, is the one who redeems. You can't redeem yourself. God is the one who crowns you uh, with authority. You can't conjure that up in, within yourself. And the only one who can satisfy you in this life is God. He's the only one who satisfies. Let me give you some scripture to back that up. Proverbs 14. It says, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from God, from above. That's what it's meaning, okay? Ecclesiastes 5.10. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. No, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance will he either be satisfied with increase. Psalm 145, 16. You open, it's talking about God, you, God, open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So let me say it again. No one and nothing can satisfy you except God. If you're looking for a new job, a promotion, uh, a raise, if you're looking for a new house, you're wanting a new car, you're wanting a future spouse, all things that are temporal will not satisfy you. You can only be satisfied by the eternal who is God. You know why? Because you are an eternal being. You are an eternal spirit being just living in this flesh suit for the time that you're on this earth. And while you're on this earth, understand that every issue, every challenge, every tough thing that you face, you can still be satisfied. Still. You can get up every day and go to a job that you really don't like it's what you need right now, and, and you're not looking at it maybe long term, but you don't like the environment. You, don't, you just don't even like going to work every day, but you can still be satisfied. And you say, well, how, Pastor? By a passionate, intentional, consistent relationship with Jesus Christ, the only one who can satisfy. He's the only one that can satisfy. Praise the Lord. You know what? Dean and I, we know, we know a number of couples uh, a few uh, couples, just like you probably do as well, that have, that have seen great success in many of them younger. They've retired young, and uh, may, they are able to do a lot of great stuff, nice stuff, and they've got nice things, but they will be the first to tell you, if they stood up here, they would tell you that, that money and stuff does not satisfy. Only God can satisfy. That's it. And remember this, if, if you're goal is just to climb to the top, to get to the top, once you reach your goal, there's only one thing to do. That's jump off. I mean, what are you going to do if you've reached the goal, the plateau, there's nothing else to do? You will become dissatisfied. You will never reach the top of God, ever. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. No one can satisfy but God. A third question. What is the result of satisfaction? If he says this, this is the only, the only benefit out of all five of these that actually gives you a result. He says that he will, he will satisfy our mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Before I go on, I want to read a passage of Scripture out of Proverbs, the 30th chapter. This is out of the Passion Translation, because this will kind of set a foundation for where I want to go here next. And here's what it says. It says, There is a generation rising that curses their fathers and speaks evil of their mothers. There is a generation rising that considers themselves to be pure in their own eyes, yet they are morally filthy, unwashed, and unclean. There is a generation rising that is so filled with pride that they think they are superior and look down on others. There is a generation that's rising that uses their words like swords to cut and slash those who are different. They would devour the poor, the needy, and the afflicted from off the face of the earth. There are three words to describe the greedy. Give me more. <laughs> there are some things that are never satisfied forever craving more, they are unable to say, that's enough. 
Here are four. The grave, yawning for another victim. The barren womb, ever wanting a child. The thirsty soul, ever longing for rain. And a raging fire, devouring its fuel. They are insatiable. In other words, they can never be satisfied. Now, what he is giving us here in that passage is he's giving us four analogies in the natural realm that aren't satisfied. And if you look at, if you look at the context of this, it's talking about a generation, it was named in there, number one, that's prideful. Number two, that is disobedient and dishonoring to their parents. Number three, that calls impure things pure. And number four, a sharp, sarcastic, hurtful words come out of their mouth. Do you want to know why? It's because they are never, ever satisfied. Never satisfied. Their attitude is what we said, give to me, give to me, give to me. We would call it today entitlement. It's a entitlement generation. I think, I think when that was written, I think Solomon was writing that about this generation right here that we live in right now because everything in there was a depiction of what we are seeing daily around us and, and, and in our society today. It's that I idea and that attitude that you work hard, but I'm entitled to what you make. It, it's like a, a leech that, you know, is, is, you try to receive life from anything and anyone rather than receiving life from the life giver. And so what he's saying here is that this generation, they're going to act this way. And the reason they act this way is because they are never satisfied. And you want to know why they're never satisfied? Is because the only one who can satisfy is God. That's it. The only one. So the results then show themselves and are bared out in our society. I wonder, I wonder something. I wonder if the challenges, the issues, and the frustrations that we, ah, we just battle with all the time in our lives. Well, I mean, we might have times of peace, but then they come back up again. We're always dealing with it, you know, kind of comes around the mountain in, in cycles, and we're always there. I wonder, I wonder if we're battling those things because we just aren't satisfied. I mean, think about it. Think about the, the tiredness and the fatigue of the society. Think about the strained relationships and you know, the continual, um, I don't know, the irritability and the bickering and the arguing. You know, wh or what about the, the, boy, I wish I had what, what they had, because if I had that, I'd be happy. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that, you know, the grass is greener on the other side mentality. And you haven't watered your grass in months or maybe even years. And it probably could look like that if you just do a little effort and, and get involved and take some steps to do some things. But, but I, I wonder... I wonder if that's what it is. See, all of that stuff can never satisfy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound this one today. The only one who satisfies is God Almighty. The only one. So the results of this benefit we read earlier says he will satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I find it interesting that God chose to use the eagle as this analogy. I, I, I love eagles. I was, I was talking with Danny yesterday. I, I used to, I don't know, I, I used to, people used to give me like little things. We got one back in the office, but that's all I've got. I think she threw out the other ones that uh, I had. And I, I love them. And I, she, I, it didn't, you know, match the decor or whatever, you know. But the th thing is this, is um, do you know I like eagles. So, if you see an eagle thing, just know, hey, pastor likes eagles. You know, I'm not asking for anything. I'm just saying, <laughs> pastor likes eagles. So the, the, the thing is this, the thing is this, is, is the eagle is, is really something because you, you do a little bit of reading about an eagle. Uh, this, this beautiful, uh, magnificent, you know, bird, I mean, you see them fly and they're so, they're so beautiful. 
You know, they, they, they can carry twice their weight. I mean, some of us have trouble carrying our weight. And, and, and it's amazing when you think about an eagle. And, and you note this as well, that the eagle, their eyeballs are the same size as a human eye. But, but the fact is they got four times the ability of, of a human eye. I mean, they have keen eyesight. And get this, their eyesight never dims no matter how old they get. Never. Some of you are saying, dear God, renew me right now. I need it, you know. Plus... Plus, an eagle gets a new set of feathers every year. Oh, yeah. So, some of you all, your feathers are kind of, eh. You, you, you need to pray for some new sprouts to come on, you know. Except you, baby. You, your feathers are perfect, just like they are. I like them. Yeah, yeah. I really like your feathers. I do. And, uh, <laughs> but for some of us here, the whole youth, you know, being renewed like the eagle, for some of you, it doesn't mean anything. You want to know why? This is because some of you are young. <laughs> You're in your youth. But for some of us, this is fantastic news. I'm telling you right now, this is phenomenal news. And I'm saying, Lord, renew me. We start thinking of all the things we need, our, our eyesight and our hearing and, and our memory. God, just let it happen. I want my latter days to be greater than my former. You know, some of you can't remember what I said just two minutes ago. And you, you need God to renew you right now. You know, I, was, I, I saw this, uh, this little story that will probably answer a lot of things for us. There was a couple of uh, senior couples who were hanging out together. The, the women were in the other room, and the guys were talking. The one guy was telling his friend about a, a restaurant that they had gone to, that he and his wife had gone to. And they said, man, the, the, the food was just out of this world. It was the most delicious food I've ever had. The service was just top-notch. I mean, man, they were right there before I even asked for anything. And the ambiance, the decor, I mean, this was, oh. It was just, it, I mean, he was just talking this thing up. And his friend asked him, what's the name of the restaurant? He said, ah, I knew you were going to ask me that. He said, he said help, help me out, help me out. It's, uh, see, it's, um, it's red, and, and it's, it's got a long stem, and, and it has thorns on it. And the guy said, well, it's a rose. He, that, Thank you. Hey, Rose, what's the name of the restaurant you and I went to? <laughs> okay, all right. You, you didn't have to pay for that. That was, uh, anyhow. He satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. Let me, just, let me just close this down. Let me ask one last question. How do you receive satisfaction? Let me ask you this. How do you receive forgiveness? How do you, how do you receive healing? How, how do you receive redemption, being redeemed? How do you receive authority, being crowned? By grace, through faith. We said it a number of times in these past weeks. And when you talk about benefits, I think a good way to look at this might be this. When you talk about benefits, like with a company you work for, those of you who have benefits, you understand this. But you will find that, that in, in companies, in businesses, benefits normally majority of the time, I'm not going to say there aren't some companies that do it slightly different, but I would probably say across the board, it's pretty general. It's the majority of the time that benefits are offered to full-time employees, not part-time. I, I wonder if God's heavenly benefits are for full-time believers not part-time, if there's any, even any such thing as a part-time believer, really. So you, you got the benefit of forgiveness. You got the benefit of healing, the benefit of redemption, of, of reigning and with authority, being crowned with that, and, and the benefit of living satisfied lives on this earth. And I, I wonder if all of those are for full-time believers, those who are sold out. Let me, let me submit to you today that you will never, ever, ever be satisfied being a part-time, casual Christian. You will never be satisfied. You are only satisfied when you make an investment, when you give all, when you 
give everything. Let me leave you with one last passage of scripture in Isaiah 53, verse 11. It says that he, speaking of Jesus, this is Isaiah prophesying, foretelling of Jesus, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Now, what does that mean? Verse 12 gives us the answer. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors and bore the sin of many. Do you see what this is saying? That's when he was satisfied. He was satisfied when he said, it is finished. That's when Jesus was satisfied. When he gave all. It doesn't say that he was satisfied when he fed the 5,000. It didn't say he was satisfied when he was healing the, the lame and the sick or, or when he was raising the dead or opening blinded eyes. It, it didn't say that he was satisfied then, although we know full well that he was more than happy to do it. It brought him pleasure to, to help people because he loves people. That's why he came. But here, Jesus was satisfied only when he gave everything. So, do you know when you will be satisfied? Yeah. When you give all. When you give everything. He'll, he'll satisfy your mouth with good things. Your youth will be renewed like the eagles when you give all. Will you bow your heads? Father, I pray that today that your Holy Spirit is working. Holy Spirit, have your way right now. Man, if some things were illuminated to us today that opens up an understanding and a perspective that we hadn't seen before, I pray that we will, that we'll press into that, that it's not, we're not going to be just hearers only, God, but we'll allow that word to go deep and to be rooted into our heart, that we'll ponder it, that we'll meditate upon it, that we'll, we'll mull it over and over and over till it becomes implanted in our in our souls and it changes it changes us from the inside out what's the Holy Spirit speaking to you today these last five weeks we've gone through five benefits that are available to every one of us <laughs> and now that we've had an opportunity to delve into it a bit now the responsibility is put on us what are you going to do with it? How will you receive it and embrace it? How will you walk it out? Will you lay it all down? Will you sell out? See, that's, that's what we have to ask ourselves every day. That's being an intentional follower of Christ. So for those of you in here who have been believers, been Christians for a long time, or maybe even if it's been for the last month or so, I don't, doesn't make a difference. You could have gone through every discipling class that's ever been offered in a church. <laughs> you, could have, you could have called out in the name of Jesus thousands and thousands of times. But are you a follower? You can do stuff, but are you, are you what he's called you to be? Or are we just all about doing? I think we all have a responsibility. And I, I, man, I had to ask myself this question. But I just don't, I just don't want to get locked into tradition and just doing stuff. And no, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. And it's a good thing. But you can do a good thing and it not be totally the right thing. The right thing is to sell out, to lay it all down, to give everything every day. 
laying it on down at the foot of the cross, saying, God, it's yours. I, I don't, I, I, these situations, these issues, these frustrations, I, I lay it down, Lord. And that, man, I take up my cross and I'm following you because wherever you go is good. Father, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving from the resurrected life. I, that thing that, that surpasses and overcomes even the powers of death, hell, and the grave. That's what I'm standing on. That's, that's why I can celebrate Easter every day of my life. It's because I live and I understand that, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in me. That's, a, that, that's the spirit that brought him back out, moved the stone out of the way, blew the soldiers back, amazed all the people, brought questions, and then all of a sudden he brings resolve because there he is. And he did it all for you, every bit of it for you. So I don't care how long ago it was that you prayed the prayer. I don't know how long, and I don't really care how long you've been a believer. My question to you today before we leave this place is are you a follower? Are you a believer, have you laid everything down for him? And for those of you who have never received Christ into your heart, you've never asked him to come in and to cleanse you from your sin and your past and you have never taken the step to repent, that means to change your mind of how you have lived life and now you're going to you're going to grab a hold of the resurrected life and you're going to follow him and and you don't even have to know everything that that entails right now but you know that it's the only way he is the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but by but by him by Jesus so Jesus said I'm the door so you come to the door and you knock, I'll open the door, but you've got to take the step to walk through it. I'm not going to drag you in. I'm not going to hook you in. No, this isn't a feel, goosebumpy thing. This is a decision because you understand now that you're lost without him. If you're in this house, if you're watching online right now, wherever you are, and you're saying, Pastor, man, you're explaining me right now. I don't, I'm, I'm not following Jesus. He's, he's, he's not the Lord of my life. You know, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in church, but sitting here doesn't make you a believer. Sitting in your garage doesn't make you a car. Come on. These are moments right now where we have to say, am I, am I satisfied with where I'm at? Or, or will I never be satisfied until... I find him and I receive him. So in this moment, as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to ask the question, if there's anybody here that says, Pastor, I want to make Jesus, man, the Savior of my life today. I want to receive him. I want to invite him into my heart. And I want to make that decision so that I know that when I leave this place, I know whose I am, that I'm not by myself any longer. I'm stepping into him and I'm gonna start following him and growing in.